You're watching BCTV. We're all about Brantford. You're watching BCTV, Brantford Government Television, a service of Brantford Community Television. This program is brought to you in part through the support of the Town of Brantford. Okay, we're going to get started. The Town of Brantford Board of Finance meeting January 30th, 2023. First on the agenda is to approve minutes of the November 28th, 2022 meeting. I will move the approval of the 72 pages of the minutes. I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded. Thank you, Charlie and Pam. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Number two is citizens' communication. If there's anyone in the audience who would like to address the Board of Finance with regards to agenda items, they're welcome at this time. With no takers, I'll move on to agenda item number three. Uh, is to hear a presentation of the fiscal 2021 audit by Clifton Larson Allen, LLP. Uh, I'm going to welcome the uh, partner, Ron Nasek, is coming up to present that to the board. Welcome, Ron. Thank you very much. Good evening. Here, I'm at the light. Am I on here? Um, you do have a slide deck that I'll go through. Um, I won't take much of your time. Oh, nice. As the chairman said, we're here uh, to discuss the June 30, 2021 financial statements. So clearly, they're a little longer than two at this point in time. Um, and while, uh, as you'll see, it was a good financial year in the town, uh, as, as of the measurement date, June 30, 2021, is in very good financial position. A lot has changed since June 30 of 2021. But uh, again, I'll take you through the reporting results, a few financial highlights, um, some required communications, and then I'll address any questions that you may have. Uh, or if, if they come at a later date, certainly you can feed them through the finance department or contact us directly. My contact information is on the last page of, of the slide deck. So um, if you need to get in touch with me, I'm, I'm certainly going to take your call. So if you want to look at that, uh, what we'll go over is, as I said, the, the audit scope, the reporting results, some financial highlights and required communications. So relative to audit scope, uh, an audit in the state of Connecticut for a municipality, uh, you know, a city or town is performed actually under four sets of standards, uh, two of which are, are married quite closely to one another. But primarily, we're, we're performing an audit under generally accepted auditing standards and our opinion on the financial statements, page one of the, of the large document that you have, uh, is the, the opinion in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards. We're also required to report to you under generally accepted governmental auditing standards, uh, the difference being that under governmental auditing standards, we're required to gain an understanding of the internal control structure relative to financial reporting. We're required to gain an understanding of compliance matters that non-compliance or a violation of compliance would be deemed material to the financial statements and report to you on those two areas uh, if there are any findings. Uh, the last two scopes really are your uniform guidance or formerly federal single audit and the state of Connecticut has its own uh, state single audit. So we report to you under both of those, though we're, those are very similar to the governmental auditing standards I just discussed. The difference being they're far more fine-tuned in that the internal control systems that we're evaluating and the compliance that we're uh, opining on in this case is relative to the major programs that were selected for testing. So the major federal programs or the major state federal or the major state programs. From a reporting results perspective, so I'm on slide five at this point, under generally accepted auditing standards, we've issued an unmodified or clean audit opinion on the financial statements, which basically says, in our opinion, the financial statements, <coughs> excuse me, fairly represent the financial position and results of operations of the town for the fiscal year ended June 30, 2021. Under our governmental auditing standards report, 
there were no matters that were considered to be material weaknesses relative to the internal control structure over financial reporting. And the results of our test relative to compliance requirements disclosed no instances of noncompliance. So clean report relative to governmental auditing standards as well. And then um, I'm combining uh, for, the, for the sake of, 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 of not carrying on forever here, the federal single audit results and the state single audit results, they are both the same. Uh, as I stated earlier, we actually have to express opinions on the compliance relative to major state programs, our, our major federal programs and major state programs. So those opinions were issued as unmodified opinions. So there were no instances of non-compliance relative to the grants that we tested under federal grants or under state grants. And then from the perspective of internal controls over that compliance relative to those grants, there were no material weaknesses that were noted during the performance of our testing. On slide six, I do uh, designate for you the federal programs and the state programs that we were that were tested uh, as selected as major programs. The selection of major programs is a criteria established by either the federal government or the state of Connecticut, so it's not something that we're deciding uh, is deemed to be major relative to the major thresholds. We do do a risk analysis on programs to determine if there are what they call type A, type B, meaning a higher risk or lower risk program. But those selections, for the most part, um, are, are driven by the federal requirements and state requirements. So yeah, as I said, you can see the grants that, that we did test. From a uh, reporting results perspective, slide eight, I've got the, the governmental balance sheet sitting in here, and I realize uh, the, the font that I can carry over to the slide deck is pretty small, so I apologize for that if you're having trouble seeing it. The main number here, and, and I, I will reiterate, I know these are, these are a little stale relative to time. It's June 30, 2021. But the unassigned fund balance, I believe, if you've got color copies, it's a highlighted number in there. Uh, if you don't, it's the second to last number in that far left column coming down under general fund. So the, the unassigned fund balance as of the end of the fiscal year was 36145295 That represents 31% of your budgetary expenditures. So that would be expenditures and other financing uses. So for the most part, that's uh, either payments, um, relative to transfers to other funds, or, or it could be, in this case, there was a refunding, I believe, so you had some, some uh, financial uh, uses going out to uh, the trust that's held in order to retire the bonds that were re retired through the issuance. Uh, overall fund balance increased four point, a little over $4.4 .4 million in the general fund for the fiscal year. If you look at um, if you want to take a note, you look at your uh, financial statements. The financial statements are set up where there's our opinion and then the, the primary financial statements, the notes, the financial statements, and then comes RSI, required supplemental, required supplementary information. In RSI, one and two are your budget statements. So if you want to take the time, not, you know, not now necessarily, but um, worth going through, you can see how you made out <clears throat> relative to what your plan was, meaning how much revenue you plan to collect and how much expenditures you plan to make during the fiscal year. What you will see is, uh, we laughed about this earlier, but you overestimated expenditures and you underestimated your, your expense, you overestimated your revenue, underestimated your revenue, yeah. I apologize, and overestimated your expenditures. So you had positive variances on both sides. You collected more than you anticipate, anticipated collecting and you spent less than you anticipated spending. Um, so, uh, you know, a win-win, if you will, from the perspective of, of budgetary surplus. Uh, the next slide is actually a slide I wanted to give this to you for two reasons. It's if you look all the way to the, to the right, that's the total general fund. So that's the $4.4 .4 million that I just talked about. If you go three up from the bottom, 4.412448 is your, your surplus for the year, the net change in fund balance. What I did want to, I, I guess, 
show you here is that there is a consolidation of a few funds that go into what, for reporting purposes, we call the general fund. Um, GASB 54, uh, generally our Governmental Accounting Standards Board Statement 54, require, basically provides the definition of what a special revenue fund is and if, if the primary or sole uh, funding mechanism for a fund is simply coming from the government itself, so transfers from the general fund uh, in order to do something else over in special revenue fund land for reporting purposes that consolidates into your general fund. It's not deemed to be an actual special revenue fund because the revenue source is not coming from an outside entity. It's coming from within the organization itself. Um, as you can see though, relative to that surplus, the pure, the far left column, general fund uh, 4.289 of the 4.412 of the surplus came out of that fund. It came out of your true general fund, if you will, uh, <clears throat> relative to what you budget. So I always like to show you uh, the changes in debt. So I'm on slide 10 at this point in time. Um, you know, what transpired relative to uh, debt via bonds payable or primarily what we talk about a lot uh, over the past 10 years actually of my career is your, your pension and OPEB liabilities. Um, the first line in there are your general obligation bonds. As you can see, you, you issued about 13.1 million in bonds during the fiscal year 2021 and you had uh, retirements relative to those bonds of 4.8 million. So that went up about $8 million, your, your overall debt related to bonds. There, As I said, there was some um, refunding that, that went on, if I'm not mistaken, Jim, during during fiscal 2021. So you got, got rid of some higher uh, interest rate debt um, with some lower interest rate debt. Relative to the pensions, uh, your net pension liability decreased during the fiscal year by 2,673,228. Your total liability year end is 39,842,486, so that's your total net pension liability. I'm gonna get into the details of that in just a second. <coughs> um, you know, although a big number, I think what I'm gonna get into uh, in, in a second is hopefully will make you feel a little bit better about that number. What is uh, really, really good here to see, and, and I'll be honest with you, is, um, is not that common. Your net OPEB liability actually flipped over to a net asset position uh, in fiscal 2021. So you, you're fully funded with that OPEB liability. Um, I can tell you throughout the state of Connecticut and throughout New England, uh, the OPEB debt that is sitting out there in a lot of communities is, is rather large and not many are doing a whole lot to fund it. So uh, I applaud you for the position that you're in. Uh, especially applaud you for the fact that right as of June, 30, 2021, the plan is fully funded. If you flip the next page, what I, with these next few, uh, these three slides, there's three plans that actually make up your pension liability. Two of the plans you have direct management over, uh, the police <coughs> plan and the volunteer fire plan. So the first one here is your police plan. This is on slide 11. All the way over to the right is what transpired in 2021. What I would have you focus on is uh, the, the last, the, the, if you work up from the bottom, those last, are the, the two before the last, so the 7.139246, if you see that with the double underlines under it, that's the liability relative to the police plan. And right below that, you see a percentage of 80.85%. That's the funded percentage of that plan. Again, this is as of the measurement date, so it's as of June 30, 2021. Um, we know in 2021, market conditions were a lot different than they were in 2022. So um, some of that may have been given back, but um, from what I understand in, in discussions with the finance director, uh, it's it's the give back wasn't that significant. It wasn't that bad, but we'll we'll find out when we get actuarial numbers for 2022. The next uh, slide is your volunteer fire pension plan. Again, focusing down on the same numbers, the net pension liability at the end of 2021 for that plan is only fifty-seven thousand seven hundred fifty-three dollars. Uh, again, right below that, you see the percentage of funding ninety-six point two eight. So that plan is 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 near full funding at this point in time as of June 30, 2021. 
And finally, the, 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 you know, the, the, the big portion of what the liability is, is the MERS plan. So you're in the state MERS plan, participate in that plan. You contribute to that plan based on what the uh, state actuaries tell you you have to contribute. You make the full contribution that they're telling you to make. Um, that liability, however, is uh, 32 million. So that's of, of the 39 million, 32 of it is coming relative to this plan. So 32 million 645 487 is the liability as of the end of the fiscal year. If you look at um, the the last number in that 2021 column, that's the actual funded status of of that plan. So although it is a uh, there, there's multi, a multitude of entities that are in the MERS plan. You kind of sit in silos. There's money allocated that, that is, is come from the town and is relative to the benefits that will be paid out of, of the MERS plan. <clears throat> so you're actually at 71% uh, funded ratio as of June 30, 2021, which, again, you're doing everything they ask you to do. If you believe in actuarial science, at some point in time, it will be fully funded. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, that, that's, you know, that's I guess the the nugget in the in the sense that there's 39 million sitting out there on the balance sheet as a liability, but you're you're doing everything you can, I think, to to manage that um, within the plans you do manage, and you're doing what you're told to do relative to the plan you can't. <coughs> And then the, the final slide is that OPEB plan. So we're, we're out of pension land. We're in uh, other, other post-employment benefits at this point in time. Uh, 2021, again, same scenario. But you see that plan went from a $294,000 liability as of the end of 2020 to a $10.3 million asset uh, as of the end of 2021. So that, um, that plan at the end of 2021 is 138% funded. So again, um, that's, that's a great position to find yourself in. The last few slides, these bullets are just topical areas that under the AICPA we're required to communicate to you. Um, you did receive a formal letter relative to these communications when we issued the financial statements. Basically what they are are, are areas that if management was showing some bias relative to the financial statements, meaning making them uh, appear better than they actually are or perhaps worse than they actually are. Um, all of these areas are in some manner or fashion supposed to capture that information and we would report that information to you. Under all these bullets, under these topical areas, there were no issues <clears throat> that percolated up during the course of, of our audit procedures that would cause us to have believed management was um, expressing any bias relative to financial statements whatsoever. So that's the end of my uh, <clears throat> presentation. Again, I'll take any questions you may have at this point in time or... Um, Board have questions with regards to the, the uh, present slide deck presentation? Mm -hmm. good Are you good? Uh, I could ask one. Charlie? Ron, on the OPED plan, why are we overfunded? Is there a reason for that? Well, I would I would suggest that um, you know you did put some put some additional funding in there, but market conditions had had a lot to do with it in 2021 as well. But, oh, but yeah, think that's the reason. It was a combination of both. Yeah, you're going to start seeing some of that reverse, uh, you know, especially when the 22 and. Uh, in future years come out because of where we are with the market because this is also looking at market value as well okay Jim and that uh, there was also a change of assumptions of which benefit it looks like a, a benefit of uh, uh, 3.9 million I yeah know. and I, I could look that up but when the actuaries did their uh, more recent valuation there were some changes in, in the did we some of that right. what's that so, yes, there were. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's the 3.9. Yeah, yeah, I see that. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Right. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. Um, your, that's uh, your presentation, correct? That, uh, you know, unless, again, there's anything else you, you want to discuss, you know, I guess since I'm here and I'm in front of a microphone, I will tell you relative to the, the, 
the time that has, has, has gone by relative to these financial statements. That is and was uh, on, on our firm. Um, we, like many professional service firms during that time frame and recently have, have uh, encountered quite a bit of attrition relative to our, our staff. And we actually, I think a week and a half or two weeks before Fielder was set to begin on, on the engagement for 2021, we lost the entire audit team with the exception of the, the senior manager on the engagement. So um, we had to, to retool that as, as quickly as we could. And um, trust me, it's, 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 it's been a volatile year uh, to say the least, but we have been able um, through some salary uh, increases, uh, substantial salary increases that we did internally within the firm, we've been able to build back not just the team that will service the town moving forward, but our entire group, uh, Connecticut and Rhode Island, had about 70 people uh, in the state and local government groups. So that's all they do. That's what they, you know, that's what they practice on. That's what their experience is in. We lost. <clears throat> more than 10% of that group um, due to attrition. Um, last, last, it, was, it was basically about a year ago now it all started, uh, maybe even a little bit over a year ago now. So uh, we are in a position um, to recover from that. Uh, I, I certainly apologize for the time lag. Uh, it wasn't Jim, it wasn't his department. It, it was our ability to service the engagement uh, for that time, you know, that, that, that time period. Thank you for that. And you're making progress with the 22 audit? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Jim uh, had a meeting with, with our manager, Mike Popham, who has done the work here for I know, longer than I've been involved, to be quite honest with you. Um, Mike is, is on the team. He's, he's managing the team on a day-to-day basis. Uh, field work is set to begin in March. That is a um, – certainly we're, we're at a time frame where we're just – you know, we're just meeting on it now, but that's the time frame that management has provided us that they're going to be ready. I know they're going through some technology uh, integration right now, so um, we're we're planning on getting it done quickly. And, and, and me being back here to report to you on 2022 sometime <coughs> this spring. Okay, thank you. Any, any other questions from Ron? Just one left. Ron, how many towns or cities does your company do in Connecticut? In Connecticut, uh, we're about 50 towns, probably 45, 50 towns. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We're by far the largest provider of you services are. to state and local government. Yes. Okay. <coughs> All right. Thanks. Thank you, Ron. Take sure. care. Have a nice evening. You too. What I'd like to do for the next agenda item is to move item number 11 uh, and take that next prior to number four. Uh, is the board okay with that? Sure. Uh, Jamie, welcome. Here and uh, so we'll hear from uh, Selectman Cosgrove and uh, Commissioner Massey. Welcome. How you doing? sent a letter that really highlighted the, the changes that were in, uh, in, the, current, in the current agreement. Uh, and it, it was uh, primarily a title change from uh, Fire Chief, Deputy Fire Marshal to Fire Chief Emergency Management Director. I think that's important to note because you see it, you know, uh, the Chief's time is uh, actually committed to that function of Emergency Management Director. Um, does receive a stipend for that additional uh, duty that we are, uh, we receive um, a, uh, a grant uh, that covers that, but certainly in terms of uh, responsibilities and efforts in that area, uh, it is uh, significant. Uh, it's not limited to just the time school we have in an emergency event, there's uh, communication systems that are being uh, implemented um, and uh, some other measures that really uh, requires attention. Uh, the salary adjustment for this fiscal year will go from 122,652.14 to 134,452.14. Um, however, uh, it is important to note um, that the 
the uh, compensation adjustment is just below actually 2.6 percent because we are removing from uh, his compensation packages uh, the longevity stipend, the fire marshal stipend, and the <coughs> paramedic stipend, uh, and those will be removed uh, going forward. So rather than having these individual stipends that over time were created um, and, and used to compensate for additional work, we're clearing those out and just putting it into the uh, base uh, salary. As well as the ability to use three six, cash it, three sick days as personal days. Um, that is something that uh, currently exists in the uh, personnel uh, unaffiliated uh, um, right now. Um, so those are really the, the changes. Um, I will give you a full copy. And then there are a couple of typos in that uh, copy that will be addressed. Um, but uh, I don't think any of the typos uh, have any impact on uh, uh, any material in terms of compensation or benefits. <clears throat> Thanks, Jamie. So this is, uh, just to reiterate, this is uh, to consider and if appropriate approval an employment contract between the Town of Brantford and Fire Chief Thomas Mahoney. So we moved uh, item number 11 up to number 4, or 3A, and um, uh, Jamie covered the highlights of that. Uh, any questions or comments for Jamie or, uh, or Commissioner Massey? Yeah, just a point of Barry? education. Sure. Uh, to you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. First Selectman. Uh, I've never seen anything like this before, so we would get any of the executive staff where you might have contracts, they would come to the Board of Finance? Yes, yeah, so... Or is this um, an exception? Yeah, because it has to do with money. Yeah, yeah so... It's funding. Excuse me? It's funding because he's, he's unaffiliated, so he's on his own. So normally those contracts come before the Board of Finance and the RTN. So, Harry, this yeah, was probably the first uh, yeah. employee, individual employee contract that has come to the board uh, since your appointment in Pam's um, But there are a, uh, a few positions that have a, a appointment agreement or a contract. Um, Chief Mahoney uh, had a, a contract that has actually expired last year or yeah, a little over yeah may, have, uh, may have 21 so. um, he asked to have another contract put in place uh, carrying out through june uh, 30th 2026 um, but there was a uh, um, so this is probably the first one that you know since your your appointment uh, previously there were some other positions that did have contracts uh, uh, former police chief, I think this body approved, uh, came through this body, um, assistant fire chief, I will say um, we did not, we do not have uh, contracts for those uh, current positions. Um, you know, we have a, a, a agreement um, where we provide uh, benefits, but it's not a contract. I think this is something that the town uh, a number of years ago uh, had uh, granted to uh, one position and then another, um, but so I think you know, our fire chief was uh, kind of had a, when he went into that take on this role. The former chief had a contract, so then requested a contract as well. Probably started in 2001. That's when it started with the former fire chief Ahern. So. Okay. So there's about a, maybe a half a dozen contracts that Even are out there. That, yeah, probably less than that, yeah. Thank you. Okay, other questions? I'll move it, Joe. The, the motion's been made to accept the contract. I'll second. Okay. This motion has been seconded. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thanks, Thank folks. you. Next is to consider an appropriate approval request for transfer uh, from the registered voters from contingency 57,612 into other supplies 7547, election workers 45,925, meals supplies $174, repairs and maintenance 3211, overtime $370, and travel 385 for a total of 57,612. Uh, 
Jim, what's the uh, contingency balance uh, for the current year? Sure. Uh, taking into account tonight's transfers, it would be 692, 621. Thank you. Welcome, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening, Jim. Uh, gentlemen, this uh, uh, lady, uh, this all is from running the uh, primary in, in August. The, uh, this is basically the cost of, for us, our office, to run the primary. Okay. The, the other, just to break it down for a little bit, the other supplies is basically um, the, uh, the ballots. And then one of the gentlemen that was on the ballot dropped out at the last minute, so we had to reorder more ballots and have those corrected. And then under, re <coughs> under repairs and maintenance, that, that is basically the, the reprogramming of the, uh, the tabulator uh, cards that we have to have done uh, every time there's a primary or a uh, general election. Okay. Thank you, Darren. Questions? No, just on your crystal ball, do you see any primaries coming up oh, for this please. year? We hope not. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right. But uh, next year, we we'll guarantee you one. Sure. I'll I'll be be one. That. If you'll only for one. <laughs> okay. Uh, motion's been. Did you make the motion? I made a motion. Motion yes. by Victor. I'll second. Second by Harry. <laughs> for discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Next is consider and, if appropriate, approve the following transfer request for human services from <clears throat> property liability insurance. 3,436 from other purchase services, 1,000. Transfer into furniture and fixtures, 3,436. And uniforms and clothing, 1,000 for a total of 4,436. <coughs> Welcome, Peter. Joe. Nice seeing you. Nice seeing you all. Uh, what we're trying to do is replace some of the um, furniture that we have in our administrative offices. Been there for a while, and they're, they're kind of worn, and they're, some of them are damaged. So this is to uh, help the, the people in the front part of the office, which includes our receptionist and our part-time staff. So we're able to uh, get the money because the private liability insurance, uh, we have some money from, from, the, um, from that budget. Um, and that'll help us because we already have some money in the budget. This will help us get to where we need to, uh, to, go to, uh, to purchase this. Okay. Questions from Peter? I agree. The furniture is pretty seedy. Pretty seedy. 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 This S C E and D Y. I think we got it. <laughs> okay. It is. Uh, it is Joe. Uh, I'll move it, Joe. We can move by uh, by Jeff. I'll second. You're gonna second it, Charlie. Sure. Okay. Is there discussions or questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 That's it. No, the second part, which is the uh, the next one. What's so, the next uniforms one? and clothing. We just want to move $1,000 from uh, other purchase services to uniforms and clothing. Actually, so this was all one motion. Yeah. Well, that's fine. So you're good. <laughs> well, that's good for me. Yeah. Got, you, you got off easy on this yeah. one. <laughs> did get off easy. I would, I would run away. <laughs> Before Charlie gets Thanks, Peter. Okay. <laughs> Number six, to, to, to consider and, if appropriate, approve, approve the following transfers and resolution for open space fund. Open space fund transfer increase of on the revenue side, 60,000 appropriation from fund balance to transfer out to 760,000. Within the capital fund, a transfer in of 60,000 and an increase of parks and rec open space repairs and improvements of 60,000. Welcome. How are you? Hey, Rich. Thank, Thank you. Good, Good to see, see you. you. Um, we did receive an explanation from Jim as well as uh, other information that you provided, Rich. Would you like to provide the highlights for us? Yeah, I gave you a lot of background information, but um, yeah. basically this is all concerning Pine Gutter Brook. It goes from Laurelville Road down to the supply ponds. Uh, back in the 70s when there was a lot of development up there with Squire Hill Apartments and condos and up on Laurel Hill, um, that was before and then wetlands. And so the drainage was never properly addressed, and it's all been funneling down pine gutter. Um, back in, was it, 95, some major issues were identified. That's where they put a sedimentation pond in. 
that it was basically filling up the supply ponds with sediment. Um, that helped for a while. In 2005, um, Parks and Open Space commissioned a study to figure out exactly how to deal with it. They came out with this huge study. I don't know how many thousands of dollars it cost, um, but the estimated cost at that time to implement everything was about $270,000. And with real no direction as to what to do. So it's been sitting there for 18 years. Um, about two, three years ago when Hurricane Ida came through, that's where we had this torrential rain, five to six inches of rain being dropped at once. Um, the erosion got so bad that somewhere along the line it went into an old farm dump and just hit all this broken glass, hardware shards and everything else, and it pushed it all the way downstream. It was becoming a major liability as uh, dogs and bicyclists would cut through the river bank. So uh, we've, we've replaced the bridge, that's been dealt with, but now I'm trying to go back and identify what can be done to solve this. So we hired a uh, engineer, uh, Davidson Engineering uh, or Environmental, um, to come up with a realistic plan. Um, that's what he's done here. I believe you have a copy of that. Uh, and really all it is is just cutting a lot of uh, down trees and branches and getting them into the stream bed to provide it, what they call a debris dam, to ideally slow down the water. Uh, if it slows down the velocity of the water, the sediment will wash, will settle <coughs> further upstream and hopefully contain you know, the major flooding going forward. Um, I had put in for $30,000 this you know, past budget just to try to identify what could be done. Um, once we started getting into the whole project, it makes sense to do it all at once, um, to get in there and just cut the trees and you know, do what you have, what you have to. Uh, the new price on that is around $75,000, $80,000. And taking the money that was already budgeted, we're short about fifty to $60,000. That's where the sixty thousand is coming from, and and the uh, the budget is outlaid on the page three of Jim's uh, memo here, pretty much for the for the amount of the sixty thousand that you're looking for. Correct. Uh, questions from Richard on this? Yeah, I want Richard. Let's take it the other way. What if we did nothing? What would happen? Um, the erosion would continue. Yeah, but then um, what? Right, what it's been doing. Every, it depends on the rainstorms we have. Uh, every three to four years, we have to actually dredge out this, the said pond, because otherwise if it overflows, it's gonna fill up the supply ponds. So that's roughly a cost of maybe $7,000 every three, four years. Um, because it's now contaminated, uh, there's no place to put the sediment, so we're dumping it in the meadow at the supply ponds. Um, because of the glass, that's the real issue. That's the liability. If you go up there and look at the riverbank now, or the stream bed, there's broken shards of glass all the way through. Mm, I saw the pictures. Yeah, and now we're taking that sediment, we're digging it out, and now we're putting it in the meadow, which, you know, when the weeds grow up and everything else, it'll be protected, but right now it's an open area. You get dogs in there, you get kids in there, that type of thing. So it's really become a liability issue. I mean, so cutting the the trees and staking them, I guess, I guess in the stream is going to slow the stream bed down. That's that's a theory. Yes, right now in many places it's down to bedrock. So when the water hits, it, it's like a channel in you know um, the southwest. Uh, it's dry all year, and then they have a storm, and it just a major flood comes through, and that's what's happened here. Um, so by trying to put these debris dams in at various locations, um, ideally that's going to slow the velocity. It's going to allow sediment to settle behind the dam. Um, and we're going to have a series of those. And then probably in a couple of years we'll have to go back and sort of add on to the dams. Okay. So Rich, you also talk about phase two. Phase two, uh, we're not dealing with that because hopefully we don't have to get there. Uh, that's where the price will go up outrageous. We have to get machinery into the stream bed, cut back the stream banks, if you will, 
Um, that's really the next step. So this is really the only reasonable step to address this. And uh, I'm somewhat related. What's the story on the, on the dam, the supply pond? The dam? Dam and the bridge, right? You got the bridges slated for, for improvement or replacement? Oh, yeah. okay, you're talking on? The supply pond. Right, that's under engineering. That's on under okay. parts and open space. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> So that, that dam was just the uh, uh, spring John's here. We ended up repairing the dam. There was a drawdown. They did all the repairs uh, required for that dam. I right here we had fun with that. Um, and that that was completed. The um, the bridge. Uh, and there was a request. Um, that, that's in our capital our capital plan as well. We just got notice that it's eligible for the uh, local bridge program with the state of Colorado, 50% of the cost. So okay. uh, engineering is looking at that and uh, uh, enter into a design agreement. Uh, Thanks, Jim. Oh, and, and the reason why this is important is because it's upstream from supply ponds. And everything that happens there, which is a really runoff from the development that occurred up off of Brushy Plains Road Correct. in the 70s, 60s and 70s, Right. It's not coming through. It's been coming through for years it's and years. It's been coming through for years, but back oh, I, 60 I years. in the back 90s since or so, that's when they built the sedimentation right. pond right. to right. hopefully contain that to prevent it from going into the supply. Okay, that answered my question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's worked until now all right. well, the glasses. Okay. Uh, additional questions or comments on this uh, 60,000? Then I will read a resolution uh, that we can consider resolved that the Board of Finance recommends to the ARTM an increase in the total appropriation for fiscal 22-23 open space fund budget from $63,051 to $123,051. Additional appropriation be funded through open space fund balance and used to fund the Pine Gutter Brook restoration project. Up here we go. The motion's been made by Jeff. Second. Second by Harry. No discussion or questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Next is to consider the request for open space transfer from other supplies, 3,000 capital outlay, 3,000 transfer into purchase services and repair and maintenance, 6,000. And this is. Um, Specifically it's, it's, for just basically rebalance the account. Rebalancing within the budget. Exactly. Now I do want to make one change. Instead of three thousand coming from the capital outlay, I'd like to reduce that to fifteen hundred. So the total amount being transferred into purchase services and such will be forty five hundred. Okay. Okay, duly noted on that. Thank you, Richard. Um, and so it's coming from other supplies? It'll be 3,000 from other supplies oh, and 1,500 from capital. Oh, outlay. capital, Correct. okay. And so then it's a total of 4,500 yep. right. instead of 6,000. I'll move that. we we'll move by Victor. I'll second. Seconded by Pam. Yep. Did I hear? Yep. yep. Pam, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank Very you. Good. Thank you. Good thank luck. Much. Next is to consider and if appropriate approve a request from the town engineer to increase the Main Street reconstruction appropriation from two hundred fifty thousand to six hundred fifty thousand dollars for consulting services. And um, welcome, John. Thank you. How's everybody? Good. Good. Thank you. So. We've got an extensive memo in front of you, but for the benefit of everybody else here, um, we go back to the, the beginning of this project. This was, um, you know, the, the project itself is under the Lot SIP program, the Local Transportation Capital Improvement Program through the state market, uh, run by DOT. Um, through that Lot SIP program, 100% of construction funding is covered, of eligible costs is covered uh, through that grant program. However, the design side of things is, is on local funding. So, um, so we, we started this project, and this, is, this will be the first lot SIP project. It, it was under a different program prior to being lot SIP. 
Uh, this is the first one that we're, we're doing here in town. We're quite sure of, of how much we can um, quote, get away with, with the, the funding sources, what would be eligible and what would not be eligible. So we kind of approach it as a kind of straightforward uh, road reconstruction. As we know, Main Street is just, it's shot, it's, it's seen its life. Um, and that was before it got cut up by the gas company and the water company this past uh, few years. But, uh, so we, we looked at basically reconstructing the, the roadway, resetting some granite curbing, make sure everything drained right, um, and that was our project. Once we brought on um, our design engineer, who is a little bit more familiar with this, this program and run through a few designs already with the state, um, you know, made us aware that hey, you know, those other elements, the sidewalks, lighting, um, traffic signalization, things like that, are eligible costs uh, since they are so deteriorated that you know, now we're not really, we're, we're not up to ADA standards. It's okay right now because it's existing, but you know, we can replace that and bring it up to, to new ADA standards. So um, that kind of totally blew up the entire project as far as the scope went. Um, we decided to really look in that other direction because again, we're, we're benefiting on the construction side with that one or 100% um, of those construction costs covered by the state program. So once we kind of went through and had the engineer do some preliminary designs, uh, came up with our estimate uh, for construction, which went from two and a half million to 8.3 million as a total project. Um, you know, obviously there's an additional cost on the design side as we're, we're increased the scope. They have to look at all the cross sections at every single building's door to make sure that everything's draining right, everything is ADA compliant, um, they want to meet all those standards. So, um, so the design engineering side uh, went from, you know, we have an initial contract for $250,000 for engineering, uh, which brings us through construction documents to the construction side of things. Um, would be an increase of 400000 for design services, so we're, we're looking at $650,000 for, for design services. That brings us all the way from uh, about Laurel Street, where, where South Main Street cuts off the state road, um, all the way to Chestnut Street on the other side. So, um, as you can imagine, there's a whole lot of brick pavers, a lot of granite um, uh, curbing, a lot of drainage improvements. They're looking at where potentially we can increase some, some lighting, because we're, we're missing a couple poles now. But you know, bringing that pedestrian lighting, that kind of level of lighting, um, to be more consistent throughout the center of town, uh, with the signal upgrades at Mono East, at Ivy Street, so we will have those those countdown timers. Um, you know, so and I believe they do also have the you know when you push the button it vibrates and there will be some sort of audible signal there for for our vision impaired residents as well. So um, pretty extensive project. Mm -hmm. um, expected to take every bit of a construction season to get done. Um, we're hoping, I know that the question is gonna be when is this gonna happen, we're, <coughs> as it is now, the, the consultants provide us a schedule that we can we can begin this in 24, the construction side of things, so. 2024? 2024. <clears throat> Once you get one more year of the Brantford Festival without all the dust and noise and <laughs> traffic. <laughs> when would it start? Uh, the construction would be, they're saying 2024 is what our consultants. Yeah, it's gonna start. Are. Right. Yeah, and how long? It'll be the entire year. It's a major, major reconstruction project. And really the, you know, this was, you know, out in the, you know, towards the east side of town where there's, there's not as much traffic and detours and trying to make sure that we accommodate the businesses and, you know, try to keep a, a reasonable amount of parking open. You know, they can get in there and kind of blow things up a little bit, but, you know, when we're, there's a lot of moving parts to this that mm -hmm. the coordination is gonna be pretty intense and we're going to try to try to get it within that one construction season no promises but we'll, I don't want to hear from more than one construction season so <laughs> sure. Good question um, when you have here the um, non-compliant sidewalk cross cross slopes mm -hmm. what's it does that mean that does that have to be at zero or what's the no there's there's a maximum of two percent cross slope two percent right and that's so people aren't really teetering over those that, that can't, you know, or have a harder ability to stand. Because you want the water to drain to the road. You need the water right? to drain, right? So we don't want icing, but so there's a 2% maximum cross there. 2%, okay. And um, I'm sure the board has questions on this. We've got the 
huge um, increase in scope on this. It includes, uh, as you can see, it has sidewalks, it's got drainage, it's got traffic and electric, utility re relocation, landscape, um, among other things. Um, where's this transfer coming from, Jim? <clears throat> So basically, this is a uh, was originally a bond authorization. So we're actually increasing uh, the bond authorization up and um, to the eight million and change, and the six fifty would be our local share that's estimated. So you have two things going on with the bond authorization. One is the ability to borrow, and two is the uh, authority to spend. Yeah, and I'm then, not seeing the uh, the author. I'm not seeing the, the resolution though. Because this is actually amending an existing resolution. Should be in the back of my item eight, at Joe's letter. Right. Where is it? It's number eight. It's number eight, it's number eight. eight I think, Joe. So, this. right, but we're on number seven. We're looking for an authorization to increase from 250000 to six fifty. I'm just looking for the. Yeah, no, all right. I'm looking for the resolution. Yeah, I, 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 I see now as I'm looking on the agenda. So, basically, uh, seven and eight really go together. So uh, initially, with the original bond authorization, it was anticipated that 250,000 of that would basically be our local share. And so now that it's going to the eight million in change, our local share is going to 650. So, uh, so, so realistically, if you look at seven and eight combined- Our local share of what? The consulting services? Our, our local share of the project for consulting services. Okay. So seven and eight are really to be looked at together. Uh, my letter uh, to amend the resolution is, is really to supplement that request. So in other words, so in order for us to, uh, to one, incorporate the changes in scope that John talked about, that the consultants identified that we can uh, do more with the project, and also recognizing that our local share would have to increase. It's all part of the eight and change million. The reason I, I mentioned the 650 in my letter is that you know, at the end of the day, that's all of the amount that we're probably going to tax for because the rest of it's going to be covered by the grant. If that makes sense. Okay. All righty. Um, <clears throat> questions with regards to, um, so we'll vote on, I guess, the local share coming, just the concept, uh, number seven, or just forget about number seven? I would forget about number seven. All right. That's, yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Number seven was John's letter that came separate from mine, so but they, okay. but they go together. Got it. So then. Thanks for the introduction there, John. Sure. We'll let, you <laughs> we'll let you sit through the second piece of it. Um, so then, it, with regards to number eight, item number, uh, agenda item number eight, a resolution amending resolution appropriating two million seven hundred fifty thousand for Main Street Road and related improvements and authorizing the issuance of two points two million seven hundred fifty thousand in bonds of the town to meet said appropriation and pending the issuance there of the making of temporary borrowings for such purposes to increase the scope of the project and to increase the appropriation of bond authorization herein by an additional $5,550,000 and to recommend the resolution for adoption by the representative of town meeting. So um, then if we go to Jim's letter under number eight, um, the first thing we should mm. ask is that if um, if someone would like me to read the entire resolution, or do we want to waive the reading? Waive the reading. Made, Harry's made a motion to waive this. I'll second reading. that. Seconded by Charlie. Thank you. Um, so, Jim, is there anything else that you'd like to add before we consider this? Yeah, the only, the only thing I would probably uh, underscore, which kind of relates to the conversation about the 250 to 650, is that even though we have a debt authorization uh, here, you know, as we've done in the past, we've sometimes uh, 
funded that local share out of out of non-debt sources. So you know, we just heard a, a report on town finances and the fund balance and other things are, are healthy. Uh, so we may down the road uh, decide to uh, you know basically fund something out of fund balance and. We'd still have the ability to spend the 8.3 million, but we wouldn't necessarily be going to the market for that local share piece. Okay, thank you. So, in order to clean this up, I'm gonna let's vote on number seven now that we have the context of number eight, and at least we have the record that we're increasing the town share for consulting services from 250,000 to 650. I'll move it. Moved by Jeff. I'll second. Seconded by Pam. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Mm -hmm. Now, with regards to the mm -hmm. appropriation of increasing the resolution, the uh, authorization to eight, it's 8.3 even, 8,300,000 for the Main Street reconstruction, essentially, project as outlined by uh, Jim and, the, and John, the engineer. Is there additional questions or discussion on this? I'll move, move the resolution. We, we none. Uh, Victor Second. moved the resolution. And it's a Jeff. move. Jeff seconded yep. the troop. Motion's been made and seconded. And um, additional discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, number nine. To consider and if appropriate act on the following proposed resolution is uh, resolution authorizing an appropriation of 325000 for the police headquarters renovation project and the financing of said appropriation by the issuance of general obligation bonds of the town and notes of anticipation of such bonds and any amount not to exceed 325000 Therefore, to recommend the resolution for the adoption by the RTM. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Chief. How are you? Good. Good, good thanks. So, Jamie and uh, Deputy Chief Elves, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Joe, if I could just provide a little background before you get into the, uh, the presentation discussion. Chief Maher, Deputy Chief House. Um, you know, for those who were on the board in Maryville two years ago, I believe it was just about two years ago, uh, we had a number of projects uh, tied to the police department. There were a number of smaller projects through, uh, primarily through the general government, buildings, budget, um, and a couple other uh, things to address with the building. And at that time, um, we elected to really take a more comprehensive look at the building uh, as well as really truly have the department evaluate their needs. Uh, so we, we took those, those uh, uh, appropriations, those funds that were uh, earmarked for those projects, and I believe we put it into the police pension uh, to offset the li future liabilities. And we just had an audit. You can see uh, uh, we're pretty pretty good standing with that. Um, we did uh, save about 75000 at the time to allow uh, the uh, chief and the de deputy chief, assistant chief, to then uh, engage an architect to really do a feasibility study of the building and their needs, operational needs. Uh, they then uh, engaged with Brian Humes of Jakunski and Humes, who went through this process, and they'll get into the details of that. Um, I just this appropriation where we are asking for 325,000 um, is to carry on those efforts uh, with Chukonski and Humes right through design development. It's also important to note uh, we issued an RFQ RFP for construction managers. The Public Building Commission uh, went through a, a, an interview process and through that process selected Downs Construction to be the CM. We're bringing the CM uh, early on with this project, uh, given the fact it is, you know, uh, maybe it's not the largest project in terms of the size um, that we've undertaken, 
but certainly is complex. It is a facility that is operational 24-7 uh, at 365, and as we know, the site itself is uh, constrained. Um, so this funding that we're seeking, as I said, will bring uh, both to the team, the Jakunski and Humes, and uh, the CM, Downs Construction, working together to get through design development. So a few things that I'll just touch upon that they'll be doing, they'll be doing the geotechnical investigations, hazardous material survey, energy modeling, land survey, sur survey services, architectural services through design development, pre-construction services of the construction management, professional estimating services by the construction manager, uh, development of anticipated schedule and any value engineering uh, if, if required. Um, at that point, with, at the completion of that process, we anticipate to come back before the board and ask for an appropriation uh, to fund the project through construction. That, uh, I'll turn it over to the chief. Uh, they can uh, really talk about their, their needs and the condition of the building yeah, and what um, they're going to address. That's good. Thank you. And um, just so that we, again, that the board is fully informed as well that uh, this is the beginning of a large re restoration project, renovation and re restoration project. Uh, right. So that, um, as we've known in the past, we've, you know, sometimes not expected a project to to be as large as it might be. So do we have any range of dollar amounts that this might be um, when we look at the full construction project? Um, I think it's, you know, early, too early to get tied to a number, and that's why we're doing this. We want to truly come forward with a, with a, uh, uh, a, a number that really will meet the project, rather than, you know, that's why we want to come for the appropriation for the full amount. But we do anticipate this to be, uh, you know, slightly north of uh, $10 million. Um, but again, uh, you know, with the environment we're in, um, you know, that, that it would be premature at this point for this, the evaluation that we've done to come in and, and guarantee a no, cap I just on. think we're so trying I to think get if a we're between that 10 to 15 million dollars range of dollars so I that think the board where, is not uh, that's where we anticipate this project right. and the, the uh, architect by the, the level of the work that's been done to this point uh, we anticipate the project to come in around that number um, and again when the the chiefs go through the project, you can see it's really primarily to address uh, a lot of things that have been identified in the past, uh, not only with the uh, uh, construction of that building, some, some you know, moisture mitigation that we need to undertake, but also just the uh, um, uh, some liabilities. I know the chief has many times talked about the conditions of the, the cells and the, the liability that those pose. Uh, to the town. So I think the bulk of the project is really down on that lower level. Um, but we also want to make sure, again, I think the, the strategy and the thought process when we evaluated that we had a number of smaller projects to do with that, you know, to undertake that building, we didn't want to have this continued interruption uh, to the building, to the operations. Uh, because like I said, it is a critical building. Uh, public safety building in town, it operates 24-7. And, and in going through this, we want to make sure what we touch and when we get into this building and the disruption is really limited to this project. And that the, the anticipation or what we're uh, hoping is that, that after we do this, we're not going back in three years or four years in addressing HVAC or, or other aspects of the building. We're not going back you know, there's only uh, you know, two years left on a, the, the roof. And like I said, even though it's primarily down on that <clears> lower <throat> level, we did an evaluation of the building and we're going to address what needs to be addressed. Um, That's fair. This project. Okay. Thank you. All right. Chief. Yes, and I was uh, <clears throat> a great introduction to the project. I thank you because you touched on a lot of points, uh, Mr. Cosgrove. But like he had said, uh, we anticipate this this is a 30-year solution so uh, we started by looking at every aspect that we can as to what needs 
um, renovation or updating and what our, um, our weaknesses are with the building. Um, so quickly, just going through some of the slides, um, just starting at the quick facts, we're at it's a 1995 building. Um, so it was new construction at that time. We're in our 27, turning 28 years old now. Um, it's about 25,000 square feet, which serves us well. We have you know, police officers and our dispatch center in there. Uh, we're at 52 officers, 10 telecommunicators, our police social worker, uh, part-time officers, um, IT, with a crime analyst, and a records clerk. Uh, so historically, the building has had high levels of moisture, especially on the lower level. Um, that resulted in you know, cracked, uh, lack of <clears throat> the floor tiles, um, issues to the flooring on the lower level, uh, rust, uh, rust in the lockers, rust on our equipment, inside the lockers, um, mold, and some dirty ductwork, which we saw through the building, uh, which we have since had clean. Uh, in 2019, we did do a slab moisture investigation, which was performed by Hoffman Architects at the time. And their findings on that investigation was that the moisture vapor rate transmission was extremely high, too high for any type of materials to, it, for the adhesive to work to the floor. Um, so they recommended a fix, which was a negative side waterproofing. Basically, it involved removing all the flooring on our lower level, shot blasting the entire area, and then coating with a, a proper epoxy coat that would keep the moisture down. Um, we're not convinced that that's an absolute proper solution, but um, that's what was recommended, which kind of got us looking at the project more. Um, one of the vulnerabilities that uh, we've identified is our cell box. Um, so they're original to the Harrison Avenue Police Department. Um, they're the old style bars, which are illegal in some states. Um, what happens there is, you know, people are susceptible to hanging themselves. It happens on a frequent basis. When you have prisoners down there, at times they'll, they'll try to do that. So uh, we lack some adequate ventilation there, and there's no fire suppression in the, in the cells at this point. So. Um, <clears throat> So there's some issues there that we need to address mm -hmm. immediately. Um, we also have 14 cells, which is a waste of square footage. That square footage can be utilized um, in other ways. So they're just too many cells. We don't house that many prisoners that we need 14. Um, I think maybe the thought process at the time was that we house more prisoners. It's kind of changed, and uh, we house less for long durations of time at our facility. Um, our females, uh, in 1995, we had two female officers um, in 12 lockers. In 2023, we have 10 female officers, which represents 20% of our, our workforce, our patrol division, or our, our agency. Um, so we are running out of space um, in the lockers. Um, there's HVAC issues in the building. Um, it's been difficult to control the temperature. It's either too hot in the summer, too cold in the winter. <clears throat> You'll find space heaters throughout the building um, if you were to walk through today. So I think the minor floor changes that we've seen over the years kind of took the HVAC out of balance. So we're looking at a proper system that more energy efficiency um, to control and replace you know, the current system. Uh, physical fitness and wellness, uh, we do have a gym which is utilized by our officers frequently. Um, space is heavily used, it's kind of, the space is inadequate to support its usage. We also have air quality concerns due to the high moisture levels on the bottom floor. Uh, our report writing <clears throat> over uh, modern day policing involves a lot of report writing. Um, our we have a small room that serves 65% of our agency, which is our patrol division. There's there's not enough space for report writing, so we need an allocation of space, better allocation there. Same thing with our evidence processing needs. Um, better allocation and use, use of uh, space for evidence processing is needed. Um, on our main floor, windows are original to the building. Um, we'd like to look at 
some hurricane proof windows, which we should have in, in this building, which you know needs to survive through a hurricane. Um, the original the building in need of replacement. Uh, inside our dispatch center, it's a 24 7, 365 operation. Over time, the uh, dispatchers are, are tasked with increasing um, the, tech the technologies have increased, which they have to monitor on their daily shift. So we need more space basically there, and we have too much space in our records division where now records are becoming increasingly digital. So some reorganization on our main floor is needed. We've had growth. Um, for example, our police social worker, we are able to fit her into <coughs> the closet. It's, and it's large enough and it suits her needs, but you know, it's a better, there's better use of the space that we have upstairs if we have the opportunity to reconfigure just some areas. And that's what we're looking to do there. Um, our exterior, our roof has been leaking throughout the building. I know that that funding has been allocated and it's been looked at and considered. Um, <clears throat> public parking, there's only two spots up front and one handicapped spot. Forces the public to walk up the hill on our exterior, so we're looking at site work as well and improvements there. Uh, we've had some issues uh, in terms of security. Um, it's open to the public. We've had first amended the audits and damage to private vehicles and some other issues. So some risk mitigation factors with our site that we'd like to, to consider and address. Uh, we do have a firearms range, which is located at the back of the building at 45 Harrison Avenue. Uh, it does get extensive use. It's, it's a great thing for us to have on site because officers are mandated to recertify annually. Um, so that was redone in uh, 2008. <clears throat> so the current equipment has about a five to eight year life expectancy. So we are looking at at the replacement cost for the uh, HVAC and the range and updating some of those materials in there. Um, we've also been working with the Clean Energy Committee on a project to meet energy related goals for the building. So the uh, scope of the project will include energy related enhancements. So basically, just that was just a quick breeze through of the slideshow for purposes of time, but uh, the focus of the project is based on the operational needs of the department, and you know we hope that the solution here is 30 to 50 years of not needing to be touched. So we're done with it. Uh, looks like it's from what we think at this point, maybe about a 13 to 15 month project. And, uh, okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Great, great presentation. Um, questions? Yes, sir. Aaron, go ahead. In the preliminary work of your planning, um, did you look at maybe a new building? I think that the cost of a new building would be considerably higher than what we're looking at here. Um, we already have the site. Um, the building works for us. We have the square footage, so we, we fit inside the square footage that we have now. We just need to reallocate some of the space, <clears throat> and then the town would have a, an extra building on its hands that, that it still have to do this work to because it's at 28 years old and it's just some of oh, these yeah, things yeah. just need to be addressed. So. Yeah, I'm sure when they looked at it 25, 30 years ago, they thought it was almost like forever. Right. And and. And the technology with policing has changed. Everything has changed. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know if that's something you, you ought to put next to it. I mean, I, I don't think we should just discard that. Um, and uh, because you are talking about the future, not only your current needs, but the future. So did the building committee consider that, the uh, need for expansion or a different facility? Um, no, not the public building committee, because as my public building committee really manages the projects as they are delivered to them. Um, I, you know, I think the police uh, deputy chief, or the chief Alves and uh, Mulhern really looked at their space needs with it, and they felt that the built, current building could accommodate uh, not only the needs of the department, uh, with some reorganization and 
uh, using uh, better use of some space, as uh, um, pointed out, the cell blocks in the lower level take uh, a large, uh, significant amount of space. Um, you know, in terms of doing a new building, um, that would be a, a significant uh, project um, in terms of cost and probably more importantly, I think from the department's name, time. Um, that would be something in terms of identifying a, a location. Uh, we think town doesn't have, I, I believe, a, a site that would be appropriate um, or that would accommodate their needs. So we'd have to acquire, by the time we go through acquire a site, um, uh, you know, design, build, approvals. Um, you know, you're, you're, it's going to be a few years. Something. Uh, and significant more cost. So I think we were looking at it, and again, a lot of it really started to address the needs uh, uh, on the lower level, but that's when we said, if we're gonna do this, does the bill, can the department, and can this building accommodate the department for the, uh, you know, future projecting out growth uh, for the non for foreseeable future? And I believe the answer was yes. As long as it's the building is appropriately modified to accommodate that. So, just following up on Deputy Chief uh, Elves' comment that it's good for 30 years. So, um, and we don't know what the future holds necessarily, but you've got 52 officers, 10, 10 communications folks. Uh, so, you've got uh, close to 60 people there now. It, will it accommodate, you know, the same? Increase in staff or needs or in the future? We believe it will, based on you know the rate of how we've grown over the past 25 years as a PD, as an agency now. We don't expect a, a major difference, um, but there is room for growth. We do have the space. Um, there is dead space in the building now that <clears throat> we are looking at using and, and right. utilizing a better more efficient manner so gotcha. so the architect look at looked at future expansion and needs of the next 10 or 15 years or whatever or longer okay charlie so are you fully staffed no are you fully staffed we're allocated um but we're currently too short um and we're in a perpetual cycle of trying to fill those but um we're having a very difficult time getting officers, certified officers that we used to be able to pick from other mm -hmm. departments that can get on the road very quickly. Um, that well is dry. There is a significant shortage in police officers across the state and nationally at this point. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go into the factors in what's driving that, but we do have two officers in the academy right now. So realistically, mm -hmm. we're down four officers right now. We average one maternity leave and or uh, a workman's comp vacancy probably pretty much all the time. Um, so right now we're, we're operating comfortably at probably five below or four below where we, we could be at optimal. How about with the opening of this recreational marijuana? I mean, is that going to need more officers? That's not going to really impact our staffing. It won't. Huh? And I, I think some of the... Um, the end results of that are still, we're still waiting to see those. We won't see those impacts, I think, until a couple of years down the road when some additional analysis uh, no, occur. I mean, I see a police car there all the time. Um, the initial opening, they did uh, hire staffing. Us, They hired us to be present. They worked with us to come up with some security plans. So that may be the reason why you're seeing them there. Okay, so you don't say the need for more officers because of that? You know, there's a couple of things we're working on. Um, as the Board of Finance, we would obviously have to, you know, come before you for, for personnel additions. Um, there's a few things that we're working on right now. One is our schedule. We're, we're in the midst of uh, analyzing our schedule to try to optimize that. And what I mean by that is even it out so that there's an even distribution of the manpower allocation throughout the entire week. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, there's different staffing studies we can we can do. Uh, I think they're all going to come back and say we're doing okay. Where I see the need for more officers in the future 
is our growing mental health issues. Um, and, you know, this isn't the forum to kind of dig into it, but just to give you a highlight, what is driving staffing in police departments now are time on calls. It's not necessarily your call volume. Call volume is your traditional measurement on what you need, but we're seeing two to three cars on a call for 48 minutes in a mental health call. Mm. Domestic disputes were almost click in an hour with two to three call cars per call. So that's what's taken the manpower off the board. So yeah, if we're going to analyze... The, listen, I thought the social worker was supposed to shorten that time. Oh, uh, no. No. No, if anything, we're providing better services. Uh, we're assisting the families here in Brantford and those that are affected with additional services, and that's, that would almost, at, at times, elongate what we're doing at these calls, because we are focusing on that as one of our, our, our core mission and our drivers of, of providing, you know, not only public safety, but with this influx that we've been experiencing over the past couple of years. So police department staffing is very complex. Would I like to come to you at some point and ask for additional officers for different programs? to increase traffic enforcement, to ease some of the pain on that time on calls to give us more, more uh, officers. There are times people call and we said, we'll be there when we can, but we're, we're, we're currently tied up. Obviously, that's maybe not the service model we want to embrace. But right now, to say in 30 years from now, we would be a 100 officer department. I've been in the business over 30 years, and I don't see growth in police departments like that. Hmm. Um, you know, could we go up 10 at some point in, our, in their lifetime? Yeah, it, it all dictates on the service model that the community expects. So, you know, will I be in front of you at some point, at some point in time with, with a hard, fast plan on what I think we need? Yes, would that include additional people? Yes, but the way the deputy and, and we've looked at the needs, the future with the architect, um, I think we're, we're in good shape. But I will say the site is, is not optimal. There is a postage stamp. There are some issues mm -hmm. associated with that. But to, to swing into a new building and, and think that that's going to be the, the fix, mm -hmm. the first selectman hit it dead on with, with some of the challenges uh, across the state of Connecticut. New police departments normally um, take two to three years if they're even successful. Um, there's many communities that are still occupying police departments that they came in front of very boards like this 10 years ago. So, you know, we're happy where our home is, and, mm. um, you know, they put a lot of thought into this. Um, my personal opinion is that we're working with the, the selectmen and uh, the deputy on this, and the deputy's the lead, is when I first looked at the building, the basement, I said something's wrong. We peeled the onion back. We started getting up at the high numbers. You know, substantial amount of money, it's just not a small contract, we're just going to do this, then we look at HVAC, we look at the space needs, and for me, the biggest one, the tip of scale was the cell block area. You know, we start talking 100 grand or more for a cell block, a single cell block, and that's doing a small scale construction, which wouldn't fit for us. So the philosophy was, in my experience, and thankfully we're with people who have a lot of experience with this, we owe you, we owe everyone to do this right, we're going to do it right, and address all the sins in the past, the degradation of some of the envelope of the building, and our needs. So with the deputy presented, uh, I wholeheartedly support, and I think it's the right track. I think it's the way we should be looking. Okay. Thanks, Chief. Thanks. Can we take another shot at it, yeah. Mr. Chairman? Harry, again? <laughs> yeah, again. All right. Please. Um, in regards to new construction, um, I think unless you take you just take a look at it, 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 it it's not going to be a lot of time and money. I think Jamie maybe knows. He probably put it in his head, and you know he said land this, the, you know, all keys. But you're dealing with a building is I don't know how old that building is. I mean, you've been the police department has been there 25 years, but the building was there before that. No, it no? was new. They were on Harrison. They were on Harrison. So they were on the site for forever. Yeah. yeah. So whatever your engineers are going to come up with, a lot of it isn't going to be known until you start ripping open those walls. You know. Well, it was built in 1995. So one of the questions is, is, um, is to look at the original construction and seeing if, if some of the issues that they have today 
were something that was overlooked or can be remediated before they start putting money into the interior. So they're going to look at the envelope, they're going to look right. at, the, at the subsurface, yep. you've got the, the drainage and water issues uh, at the lower level, so I assume that that's part of the engineering and the architectural review, but it rel is a relatively new building compared to the other buildings that we replaced, which yeah, were built in 1960. So this is thing was built in 1995, and so um, it's not like it's an unknown. Mm -hmm. um, the other facility where the range is is uh, a separate mm -hmm. building, okay? Uh, but that again is uh, an old structure that was has been worked on from time to time. But um, so, um, well, I a, think we've, a new building. Ahead. You where do you want to put a new building up? Give me uh, 24 hours, I'll come back to you. <laughs> well, I, I didn't come tonight. I'm staying to, here tonight for 24 you know, hours. Okay. We are fortunate that the team that we brought on, Jukowski and Jones and Downs uh, Construction, have an extensive experience with the public safety arena in terms of designing and building public safety buildings. So, in terms of having, when we come back to see, you know, what is the cost of new compared? We can we can certainly put some budgetary numbers on that. So the board is you know, making a decision on uh, a full appropriation appropriation for the full project. We have that for as a comparison. So I, I can talk to the team about developing those numbers and evaluating what it would be. But the challenge is, as the chairman just alluded to with this question, I know it was just, but Finding a site is is a difficult is more difficult than you would think. Uh, now North North Brantford uh, went through um, about three years of, of with our former chief taking the lead up there, Kevin. Uh, is and I they still haven't broken ground yet, and that's they've been looking and they've changed sites about four times, and I think they're back to across from the existing station, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I believe so that um, and helpful. they're. So I think Harriet, at this point in time, uh, again, it's up to the board to, to, to consider this as a whole, is that um, this has gone through a, the internal process, working with the town administration, the engineers, the, the engineering department, uh, Jamie's office, uh, as well as the architects, and, the, and they've chosen a CM for this project. So to some extent, they've, they've I assume that they've looked at um, some of those uh, build versus fix. Yes, yeah. and, and that was a question really, even really early on, um, is will this building, you know, uh, accommodate the needs uh, for the department in the foreseeable future? And you know, I'm relying on those who are actually utilizing the building in there on a daily basis. And uh, uh, the, the answer was, you know, they, they felt strongly that it, that it would. You know, as uh, the chief said, um, and the uh, deputy chief pointed out through the presentation, they, they feel that there's a lot of dead space within that building. The architect pointed out some ways that they can address the, the uh, and really achieve meeting the operational needs of the department. So I'm relying on, on those who, you know, that question was asked early on. Did we go through analysis to do a cost comparison? Comparison? No, we have not done that. But the question was asked very early on, you know, uh, beyond just what we're addressing, will this building continue to meet the needs? Um, and, and the sentiment, overwhelming sentiment is yes. Yes, and there's some challenges with the tight site, as the chief pointed out. It is a OSHA stamp. Um, but, but, you know, we're going to try to improve that as well. Um, mm -hmm. And we need to we need to be centrally located. So when now your pick of, of other sites gets a little smaller, we, we can't be on one end of the town. We we need to kind of be central. Um, and then one one thing that if you look in the back of the building, the radio tower, there's a lot of money in that radio tower, and it's in great shape. It's still got plenty of useful life, and there is state fiber that runs in there for our telecommunicators. It's a large cost there. Um, just to kind of like throw it out in perspective, Wallingford PD is, is taking over an existing building. Um, 
and they're at 20 million for an existing building that they're retrofitting to become the police department. Wow. So, you know, in terms of say, I don't think 30 million would be out of out of the ballpark, and then you have an existing building that you still have to put a fair amount of money in to reuse for the town. So, you know, the, the scale of that starts to become what's in the best interest. I, I think we're all comfortable with where we are, and uh, like the first selection said, there was a lot of thought put into this, you know. So, I, I just don't know if, if, as the deputy put it, the path to the proposal, you see the incremental steps we took to bring us here. Um, you know, we would love a new building. We would love, you know, that'd be great. But, you know, state of the art, wonderful, great. But where's the site going to be? How's it going to impact the future financial strength of the town uh, in light of this market? And, and like the first second said, we could be sitting here for three years, and I'm still utilizing old cell blocks and moisture in the basement. So, I think right? to uh, to Harry's yeah. point, uh, it, it's it behooves the board to ask these questions, and so that. Um, I think the the the, uh, the transparency here is, is helpful, and um, the discussion is good. And knowing that again, this is not we're not spending you know, the, the three hundred twenty-five thousand tonight. We're we're starting on a path that's going to be a major construction project. That again, um, we're all going to be having you know additional votes on in the future. But this is a uh, good discussion because we're you know going in with as much information as possible at this point in time. Uh, it, even though we're starting at the approving such a small amount relative to the total project. So additional questions that we have from the chief for the two chiefs or selectmen? Well, just the comment. Jeff, go ahead. So we've been talking about the water project here at the police department for a couple of years now. And I, I think uh, the chief and his deputy are on the right path. They're in a central location in town. Um, and if they're doing all this due diligence, they're going to make a final presentation for the entire building. I, I think, uh, you know, we need to, you know, take their lead and they can make the presentation to us in the future. So I, I agree with what they're, what they're doing. Trying to find another parcel in town that makes sense is not probably feasible. So would you, um, I'm would looking for it. somebody to move. Uh, I will move it. Well, first I want to move uh, a, a, a motion to waive the reading the full resolution. I'll uh, move the motion to waive the reading of the full resolution. Seconded. Seconded, Seconded by Charlie. Is there a discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 So um, with that, I'll, if there are no other questions, I'll consider a, uh, a motion to, and I'll read the resolution again here, to consider if appropriate act on the following proposed Resolution resolved, uh, resolution authorizing the appropriation of 325000 for the police headquarters renovation project and the financing of said appropriation by the issuance of general obligation bonds of the town and notes in anticipation of such bonds in the amount not to exceed 325000 thereof and to recommend the resolution for adoption by the representative town meeting. Uh, motion made by Jeff, seconded by by Charlie. Thank you. Um, is there additional discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Good, Thanks, good luck and keep us posted. Thank you. Okay, next, number 10 is to hear a presentation regarding a future funding strategy for the Solid Waste Sinking Fund, and if appropriate, approve the following transfer and resolutions. And I will read the proposed transfers and resolutions and um, resolve that the Board of Finance recommends, I'm sorry, let's see, resolution for creating the Solid Waste and Recycling Equipment Fund. Resolve that the Board of Finance authorizes and recommends the RTM establishment of the solid waste and recycling equipment fund sinking fund. And that was got an extra fund. And the second um, resolution for consideration is resolved that the Board of Finance recommends to the RTM an increase in it 
fiscal 2023 ARPA fund budget from 2727000 to 3652000 The appropriation will be used to fund the single stream recycling bins and will be funded through an appropriation from the ARPA fund balance. And specifically, the, the transfers would be threefold, increasing an increase fund balance transfer of 925000 and increasing the expenditure side of the um, recycling uh, of, of the uh, solid waste side for recycling and solid waste equipment, 925000 and the capital capital transfer from 700 uh, count transfer station improvements, 323101 uh, and likewise uh, transfer to fund 721 for the same amount, 323,101. And uh, the third piece of it is general fund contingency, fund contingency 100,000, and then transfer out to fund 721 for 100,000. Jim, with all of those uh, movements and such, uh, we're gonna, Get some explanation on this between uh, everybody here. I would say be between everyone here, we'll be able to describe the scenario that we find ourselves in, and I'll, I'll allow Jim to start well, 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 initiated I'll, the proposal. I'll say two words, and I'll kick it back to Paul and Jamie because I think what you kind of see here is a trend tonight where somebody's asking for money and somebody's talking about how to fund it, and so. Uh, we had that with the engineering project, police headquarters, and uh, this project is, is no different, really. And so uh, we, we, we could do the financing piece first, and then they can, they can talk about the why. I mean, they're, they're somewhat inseparable. But uh, basically, as this board may remember, uh, about a year or so ago, you approved 56000 out of contingency to do a study of the way we uh, do our curbside collection and the way we do our recycling program. Uh, the long and short of it, which, which these guys will get into, uh, resulted in a, uh, a different approach uh, as it related to the recycling. Uh, part of that was a single stream. Those, you might have seen large toters in other communities. I think there's two different sizes. They uh, are operated from a machine that picks it up with one arm. Well, I mean, it's a single arm. It's one driver per truck. Um, and they'll get into some of the more details. And uh, we had talked about this at the prior Board of Finance meeting about some of the funding commitments on the horizon. And so then the question is, well, how, how do we look at this and to have the least impact on a taxpayer, recognizing that you know we're gonna have equipment needs going forward, we're gonna have to replace some of these things. And so uh, some of the board members may recall some years ago, we had taken some, some one-time uh, revenues from a, a Bristol distribution and we set up an account for uh, improvements to the transfer station as it relates to uh, equipment specifically. Uh, we had done some work there on the scale. Uh, GGB, General Government Buildings, as, you, as you're all aware, does the work on the buildings. And so the thought was, well, let's identify a couple sources, combine them, and then try to outline something for the future. So if you kind of look at, at this spreadsheet here, that kind of outlines the whole the whole section. You have 323,000 in an existing appropriation. You have a, uh, a contingency transfer of 100,000. Uh, rough estimate on, on what, what we're looking to spend is about a million one. And 925,000 is, uh, is committed to ARPA. And then we have balances going forward. When you start getting into the out years, obviously it's a uh, it's a little bit of a, it gets a little fuzzier, but we do know that this program is going to cost us money over time. Uh, these guys will talk about how it actually will save us money over time as well. But so essentially, in order to execute all those pieces, we have to transfer the 323000 into the sinking fund. We're taking 100000 from contingency into the newly created sinking fund. The 925 is going to stay in the ARPA fund because, as you may recall, ARPA dollars can't go into reserve or sinking funds. So part of that expense will get charged to the ARPA fund, and then the balance will get charged to the sinking fund. And then we have a mechanism uh, moving forward. 
So that, that's my piece of it. Thanks, and then Jim. these guys. That makes sense of it. Yeah. Gentlemen. Yeah. Just, if they just before I turn over to those, Paul Muniz, uh, Chairman of the Solid Waste Commission. Um, yeah, so we're here really to, we're setting up this fund. In the next couple months, we'll, in the upcoming months, uh, Paul and I, I'm sure, will be uh, before you uh, discussing this, uh, both in, for contract review and budget requests. Um, so we're going to have a lot of discussions coming up in the next few months regarding this issue. Um, but for tonight, as, as Jim has outlined, we're really just making sure we have uh, the, the funds set up so we can progress through the process that we're undertaking right now. I'll let Paul get into the details, but just so you're aware, the town is in the midst of uh, uh, evaluating uh, RFPs, a request for proposal for the change in our uh, curbside collection and disposal of municipal solid waste and recycling. I mean, with that, I'll let Paul go into the uh, uh, touch on the details of that and what that means, but that's really what we are. So, like I said, we're in the process. We want to have funds in place, um, you know, uh, in order to execute an agreement. But um, so there's not a, an agreement at this time, but there we, we do expect that it will be uh, in the coming month or two. Thank you. My name is Paul Muniz. I'm the chairman of the Solid Waste Management Commission. Thank you to Jim Finch and First Electric Cosgrove for their efforts thus far in the task that we are undertaking at the commission. I've been before you in previous years talking about the uh, curbside collection and recycling contracts that we've had in the past. As I've said in the past, it is typically the largest outside service contract that we have in our town budget. The contract expires June 30th. A year ago, we started the process of educating ourselves, the commission, and the residents on the topic of what should we collect with respect to recycling, how should we collect it, and what happens to it after it's done so that we could plan on collecting it the proper way. Um, that was precipitated by increases in costs for processing recyclable materials, which for decades had, in many cases, represented a revenue stream to the town. Um, the study that we undertook illuminated for us the fact that the reason we were seeing costs was not due to anything that our residents were doing, and not specifically due to anything that our contract service providers were doing was principally due to the change in the economics of the recyclable materials market. Acknowledging the fact that the likelihood of ever seeing revenue from recyclable material was going to re, re, return, um, we've taken a different approach in the request for proposals for curbside collection and recyclable material processing for the contract that will start July 1st. Um, the, we are seven steps into a nine-step process. We'll be holding interviews with the bid responders tomorrow with the expectation of making a recommendation to the commission for award within the subsequent, subsequent weeks thereafter. The approach that the Solid Waste Management Commission is inclined to select we have not selected a vendor, and we have not begun negotiations yet, would move to a, the, the manner of trash and recyclable material collection, which is used in most towns in Connecticut, which is referred to with respect to recyclables as something called single stream. Um, as Brantford residents, for decades, the residents have segregated their recyclable materials into bins based on what the material is. In most other towns, all recyclable materials, truly recyclable materials, are put in one wheeled cart um, that is left at the curbside along with a wheeled cart for typical household trash. Our trash is sent to an incinerator, burned, turned into steam, turned into electricity, trash to energy. We have a solid contract with the Bristol Resource Recovery Operating Commission, what it was formerly called, 
to continue that process for, I'm going to say, another 12 years. Might be eight. Um, are recyclables in comparison to the segregation of materials that our residents have done for years would go into a single container that would be collected at the curb. Given the changes in economics where recyclable materials no longer have any revenue potential to us, um, the method by which the town has traditionally collected materials left at the curb has been manual. So we have a truck, two trucks, drive around town, men, women, uh, follow the trucks and move the materials into rear loaded trucks. The convention that is that we have learned through our study is to move to an automated system with specific mechanical vehicles that can obtain those wheeled carts and collect them into vehicles without staff following the truck. Um, so the labor committed to each route goes from three full-time equivalents down to one driver. There are many more vehicles available in the state to operate in that manner than the kind of relic method that we had convinced ourselves was useful to us. Um, Given the potential savings and costs by going to an automated collection method, we hope to offset the increased cost of processing recyclables, which no longer represent revenue to us. We've obtained, as you may recall, five years ago, when we went out to bid for the service, we got one bid. Um, as we saw the bid period ending, the contract period ending, in anticipation of being in a one bid situation, we used the study to modify what we would do so that this time around we received four bids, one of which <coughs> was not responsive. We have three bids to choose from. I think I've told you in the past my concern <coughs> that uh, when the current contract ended, we might see an increase of up to 100%. Uh, the low bid currently represents an increase of 21% against our current costs. So by moving to a different approach, we have the potential to control our cost increase significantly. What that 21% increase doesn't include is the cost of capital equipment, two 95-gallon carts for every taxed household in Brantford. It's 8,900 taxed households. I mean, we need to buy 17,000 carts and have them delivered to every address. Um, the typical average life of the carts from the manufacturer is estimated to be seven years. The prospect of buying those carts um, and maintaining those carts for seven years is addressed by this potential sinking fund that would be set up, potentially using ARPA funds, um, to prepare ourselves for uh, reacquisition of carts seven or eight years from now um, and continued operation and continued maintenance of our existing facilities consistent with the intended use of the designated $323,000 that remain in the dedicated capital fund. Thank you. More? Um, I could probably tell you more, but no, I think that's, that's okay. probably a mouthful. So uh, are there additional uh, <laughs> changes that need to be done at the transfer station? There are a couple of modifications to the transfer <coughs> station that modifying our procedures could allow um, in terms of how we use the existing bays. Um, we are, uh, the commission will address those topics after we get through the contracting okay. process. Okay, I'll leave it there for now. Questions from Paul? Just a curiosity, how, you know, with those um, bins, yes. right, you know, you see them do it with the big dumpsters, they have to line it up properly and everything. Yes. So how, how is that going to work? Residents just put them out with one drive, does the driver have to get out and make sure no. it's lined up? No. No. So um, <coughs> there will be, the, we're talking about a major change. Um, there will be an educational period that we're going to have to go through. We're going to have to um, teach our 
residents the proper way to do it. You know, it's done in most other towns in Connecticut. It's done in North Brantford. It's done in, you know, our neighbors, towns. I don't think they're any smarter than us. So I think we will be able to get it done correctly. Um, I, you know, I think that it's going to be important to have a label on the carts that says this side out so that when people bring them to the cart, they're facing the right direction. Um, and there will still be neighborhoods in town uh, where based on bridge clearance and road width, we might not be able to use the, the full process um, with the full size vehicles to collect them. So um, that is a period of negotiation that we will be going through between now and implementation day, which will probably be right after 4th of July. Assuming we successfully negotiate everything that needs to be done. Charlie? Hey, Paul, that was a very clear explanation. It helped me a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, on the, on the containers, now the 8,900 households, every household will have to go to the, what gets two of them? Yes. And they would have to go to the, Town hall to pick them up, or no? The the contract will be set up such that the manufacturer and the the manufacturer will either the manufacturer will deliver them as part of their contract, mm -hmm. or the collector will deliver them as part of his contract yeah. right after fabrication. Listen, you mentioned though that these uh, containers would have to be adjusted just right when they're set up there or not? I have not been a customer of this process. Maybe on a vacation I've done it, but um, uh, my observation is that the, the, the truck that picks up the containers has the capacity to get it done. Mm. I have seen the truck on other streets, yes. yeah. but I haven't watched how it actually worked. It's, got, but, it's like a forklift. Yeah, right. It's got two forks. It comes out. They have some play. As long as the bar where it grabs is faced, facing the right direction out, uh, you know, the, the operator can grab it, hook it, and, and, and there's a, I think yeah. they have a distance, okay. so it, not only up and down, but it will go out. <clears throat> It is the industry standard at this but point. That's you know, but, but, you know, the, now the, all this is going to happen prior to July 1st? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. You think that's going to happen has in to. time? It has to. I know, I know it has to, but will it? Yes. <laughs> it's just, it's <laughs> we don't have an sure, option. We'll part of it. As, as I am. So, uh, any other questions? No. Um, this, um, so, there's several, um, yes. several moving parts on this one. So the first one would be resolved that the Board of Finance authorizes recommends the RTM the establishment of the Solid Waste and Recycling Equipment Fund sinking fund. Yeah. It's got an extra fund. Yeah, you know, it's one of those pairs in the uh, spring. You don't see the second uh, I guess. So uh, someone want to move that? I'll move it. I'll move second it. Moved by uh, Jeff, yeah. seconded by Victor. Uh, uh, discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And the next is uh, resolved that we're uh, recommending to the RTM an increase of the ARPA fund budget from two million seven twenty seven to three million six fifty two, and that the appropriation will be used to fund single stream recycling bins will be funded through the appropriation of the, from the ARPA fund balance, and that's the nine hundred twenty five thousand part. So I'll take a motion on that. I'll move that. Second. Moved and seconded again. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And then we have the capital transfer, which I read previously at 323,101. that. Moved by Charlie. I'll second Se it. Seconded by Pam. Yep. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And then lastly is the transfer from contingency into fund 721 for 100 grand. Move it. Moved by Jeff. Second. Seconded by Victor. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you and Thank good you. luck, Paul. <laughs> we need luck. Yeah. And, and Stay optimistic. Okay. Uh, item number 12 is the revision of the 2023 Board of Finance schedule of March budget hearings. And um, we are asking that 
the consideration of the board to move the budget hearings from the week of the essentially the 13th to the week of the 20th with the appropriate uh, dates of the 20th, 21st, 23rd, and 27th. Uh, and if this is something that's acceptable, I'd let Pam make the motion. <laughs> make a motion. I move, move it. Motion has been made by Pam. Second. Second by Jeff. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, <coughs> and uh, with no other business becoming for the board, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion has been moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. This program was brought to you in part through the support of the Town of Brantford. Watch town meetings and other videos on demand at BranfordTV.org.